Great. All right, take um, it away, Eric. Thank you, Tom. And the uh, other TASI organizers, of course, Ethan, Oliver, Tom, for um, asking me to lecture here. Um, and I myself was a TASI student. Um, it's a shame I can't be back there in person, of course, needless to say at this point. But um, I just want to emphasize to, um, to, to you students that it's not lost on, on me how what you're sort of losing out uh, having to do this remotely. And um, in connection with that, I understand it's week four. And uh, that is another 30 hours of Zoom that you're staring at this week. And so I hope that after three weeks, you're feeling extra inspired by what you've heard. And I've seen several of the lectures myself, and I really enjoyed them. Um, and that's how I felt after my first three weeks of Tazi. But you're also probably exhausted. And that's OK. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to um, take that into account in terms of the way that I organize my lectures. So I think that if I were to just bludgeon you with, with formalism, that would end up just going in one ear and out the other, or at least there'd be some, some chance of that if I were in your position. Um, so I think it's always important to, to stress the big picture of what one is trying to learn. And so we're really going to spend some extra time doing that, especially today to get you interested and hopefully keep you interested through these four lectures. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're really going to talk about the big picture pretty much for all of today's lecture. Um, and in the next three lectures, we'll talk about how you accomplish some of the things that we'll be talking about. And I encourage questions, uh, maybe even more than unusual, to, to keep yourself engaged from uh, and uh, from falling off the down the steep slope of, of too much Zoom. So anyway, so that's that's the philosophy behind uh, today and the and the, and the days um, after this. I also you know thought about giving a set of reading background reading, but honestly, I just wanted you guys to like relax this weekend. So um, <laughs> come into these lectures feeling ready to to learn and listen. With that said, now that we're starting, I will be putting stuff on the wiki in connection to the lectures and. I think an important aspect of learning a subject is also knowing where to look to find things out. And so I'm going to try to list copious references in connection with what I talk about. And feel free to ask me at some point today, um, you know, if you have a question where, where you can find out more about that um, or on the Slack channel. Um, so uh, good. So a quick outline of, of the way the, the week will go is that Today, so, so first, what does Bootstrap Radio CFT mean? I'll be, I'll be telling you what, what, how I'm going to interpret that. Um, it means perhaps what you think it means, which is that we're going to talk about the classification of and properties of holographic CFTs, um, the sort of taxonomy of this space, and what the conformal bootstrap on the CFT side can tell us about gravity, and to some extent, what we're learning about holographic CFTs from gravity. Um, and what a lot of the open questions are. And there are a lot of them, even though this subject is very large and pretty old by the standards of, of our field. Um, so today we'll, we'll really just be talking about the big picture of what that all means. Um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about four point functions and some techniques in computing holographic correlators, which are one tool for answering some of these questions. And uh, what those imply about uh, the space of large N CFTs. That'll continue on day three where we transition into maybe a more um, taxonomic approach to the space of holographic CFTs. And, um, and then finally, on the fourth day, I thought I'd give extra uh, attention to ADS3 CFT2, where there are some special techniques that one can use, uh, modular invariants, for example, some of which you heard about in Alex's lectures. But uh, I think mostly you, you didn't really hear about this aspect of it. And so, so the fourth day will be largely spent focusing on the, the ADS3 CFT2 case. And then hopefully wrapping things up, summarizing and talking about some, some open questions. Um, so that's the ambition. And we'll see if it ends up being as organized as that. But um, uh, good. And, and of course, the last sort of administrative comment I want to make is if you have serious questions about string theory, you should direct them to Iren and Natalie. And if you have questions about how physics actually works, you should direct them to, to Dan Sum. Um, good. So uh, let's. Get this going here. Let me share my screen. 
statement. All right. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so everyone can see this like I can. All right, great. One day it won't be necessary to ask those things, but I still really need to ask. Okay. Um, good. So, uh, well, one more thing before we really talk about this. So this is a photo from Tazi 2011, um, or 2010 rather, when I went, uh, just for fun. So there, there are several people perhaps you would recognize um, of course, many people here um, still in the field, many friendships formed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, bonus points if you can find me. I'm going to move on now, but you'll be able to find this in the recording. So um, here's a fun thing for you to do later and a, and a, and a reason to, to rewatch the lecture on recording if you need to. <laughs> OK. Um, I see Tom still peering at it, so I'm hesitant to move on, but I'm going to move on. <laughs> I'm good. OK. Um, all right, so these lectures will be about a question which can be phrased in various different ways, but, but really um, we're trying to understand in a conformal field theoretic point of view, the emergence of space-time um, from large n. And so ADS-CFT, has been around for a while. And you know, roughly speaking, I think in the beginning, the arrow went more this way, what we we're learning about strongly coupled CFTs from ADS gravity. And then, and again, this is a bit of a caricature, the arrow started to, to shift in the sense that um, techniques on the CFT side were, were employed to give us insight into ADS, ADS gravity. And today will be sort of more about well, these lectures, really, it'll be more about this arrow. Um, Although, of course, both relate to and inform the bootstrap. So what are some of the big questions that we're going to try to answer or touch upon? So the first is, well, what is the space of large N CFTs? And slightly more precisely, uh, what are necessary and sufficient conditions for a CFT to have a nice holographic dual? And of course, uh, the question that this raises is, what does this nice mean? <clears throat> you might mean something like Einstein gravity coupled to low spin matter. Um, that is maybe a prototypical holographic CFT. Uh, and so one wants to understand what conditions on the CFT set one must impose and what the minimal such set is for this to follow in the bulk. And a second big question is that gravity Right. predicts striking features of holographic CFTs. Can we understand them on their own terms in CFT? Understand or derive in CFT. And of course, there are many more questions under these pretty broad umbrellas. <laughs> so, um, and again, please interrupt if you have a question. So, CFT local operators. Oh, furnish irreps of the conformal group. Just like CFT, comma two, and that's in signature. And this contains a maximal compact subgroup of SOD. So two, 
And so these operators O will come with some set of spins, J, and they can form a weight, delta. <clears throat> Uh, if there are global symmetries, then the operators are also characterized by global symmetry charges. And if the theory is superconformal, then uh, operators furnish irreducible representations of the superconformal algebra. And so, in particular, if there's a bosonic R symmetry, then the operators have an R charge as well. And so, with respect to the local operator sector, um, well, sorry, what, one more comment before transitioning to that. These operators obey an OPE. So if I take the product of two operators O sub i and O sub j, then I can expand this as a uh, linear combination of other operators O sub k or sum over k. And so, From the abstract perspective, CFTs are just lists of operator dimensions and OPE coefficients that obey certain consistency conditions. One of them is unitarity, uh, which places lower bounds on the dimensions of operators, but there are others. The list of such consistency conditions is time dependent. Um, we also don't know what the minimal such list is, and we don't have a fully axiomatic formulation of conformal field theory. So that's partly why this is an evolving subject. Uh, but from the bootstrap point of view, what one is trying to do is to constrain these lists by imposing the consistency conditions we know, such as unitarity. OK. So the conformal bootstrap. Well, first of all, it's quite a big subject and you've probably figured out that if you wanted to read a bit about it vis-a-vis uh, -vis background material, you would uh, perhaps read Davidson and Stuff and Stasi lectures from a few years ago. Uh, Salva Richkov has some very nice lectures. Um, and so, so in these lectures, we're going to implement the bootstrap in a narrower context than uh, it's its most broad incarnation, but there's a lot to say. Uh, and so what is the conformal bootstrap? Well, it's really just an effort to constrain, excuse me, to constrain the space of and the properties of CFTs. And that's pretty broad and Indeed, I think when people use the, the phrase conformal bootstrap, they mean uh, that to different degrees of generality. So the broad sense is to constrain CFTs abstractly um, by any means necessary using symmetries and consistency conditions alone. In other words, not just trying to construct all the CFTs you can, but in trying to try to constrain what they could possibly look like. There is a, say, narrow version of the bootstrap, which is to impose oops, Let's that. To impose unitarity on crossing symmetry on local correlators in vacuum. <clears throat> Now, tomorrow we're gonna to talk a bit more about what crossing symmetry is and how one imposes that and what, what this means. Um, and uh, so in the, in the sort of narrowest version, one looks at four point functions uh, of local operators in vacuum and the crossing symmetry follows from the associativity of the OPE of the constituent operators. Um, of course, there are notions of the bootstrap in between these two. For example, you might look at correlators not in vacuum 
Um, and of course, you, you might be interested in features of CFTs that lie even outside this paradigm, namely the space of extended objects or non-local operators, which so far the bootstrap doesn't have so much to, to say about, and I won't have anything to say about. Uh, are there any questions so far? Okay. Um, good. So what are some prototypical bootstrap questions? Uh, let me just name a few. Um, the one is to bound the first non-vacuum primary operator dimension. Vacuum, primary, uh, over and above those input implied by unitarity in particular. So let us draw an axis in delta. And the vacuum has dimension 0, where I just remind you that delta is the eigenvalue under the rotations of some a local operator or some state, uh, the two, those two being equivalent notions given the state operator correspondence. And so you might ask, what is the, how uh, heavy, so to speak, is the lightest operator allowed to be? So how large can the gap between the vacuum and some operator O star with dimension delta star be in a consistent unitary CFT? So you're trying to maximize delta star consistent with physics principles. Another prototypical bootstrap question is to do the same thing uh, in a given OPE of some operator itself. So if this OPE say includes vacuum, say if this was some real scalar primary operator it would include the vacuum and then some operator O star and you want to max, and here I'm ordering them by conformal weight. So you'd want to maximize delta star appearing in this O times O OPE. Another question you might ask is, could I ask? What, um, yeah, please. What's the physical intuition of that that second type of thing? Why why is this something you would you would want to bound? Um, good. So. Let me give you um, an answer that's maybe a little holographic. So the if you have, say, a large n theory and O is some single trace operator, then um, the first operator appearing in its in its OPE with itself might be a bound state. Um, and so you might try to constrain bonding energies with this kind of approach. Um, but, but more generally, just putting away large n for a second, uh, if you have a four-point function that you're studying, uh, you might want to know, you know, how large can I make the gap in this particular four-point function? Say, if the operator O is some special operator which exists in some universality class of theories. Um, so, so it's a way to um, sort of connect the interactions of the theory to the dimensions, right? Because the operator has to appear in this OPE. Um, and given that, you want to ask how heavy can I make it? So there's some interplay between the OP coefficients and the dimensions in this kind of question. Um, those are two separate answers, which maybe are helpful. Any other questions? OK. Um, good. So you might ask, what are the universal properties of the spectrum of, uh, say, any CFT? Uh, implied by crossing symmetry. So it's a naive question. Is it, uh, yeah. could it be zero? Like, like, uh, uh, like my question is like, is there any, like, does anybody ask like, what is the minimum gap? Like, uh, or can the gap be zero? Maybe it's too naive. Usually one starts by, one would, at the outset, often one is interested just in CFTs of the discrete spectrum. And then you are sort of, you'd like to impose in your method that there is a non-zero gap. Um, uh, you can't always do that, actually. And so in, in, in 2D, like in the modular bootstrap approach, that can be a little, a little tricky um, to actually implement. But often, 
the physical interest in the, is in theories with the gap. And then so you, uh, people tend not to ask that question because they, they don't care to know the answer. But um, yeah, you could ask um, if I have say non-compact CFT, which is say one with a continuous spectrum, um, what does this, what is this theory allowed to look like? Um, then you'd have to ask, of course, you know, different questions than, than this one because the gap by construction is zero. And then you zero. maybe want to ask, what is the spec, what shape does the spectral density take, or something like that. Okay. For most applications, though, people are interested in CFTs with discrete spectra because once you have a continuum, then certain familiar notions diverge. So, for example, um, you know, the density of Operators in any window, any finite window is formally infinite. Likewise, for some OPE density, we have some some of our operators with by OPE coefficients, and so you can divide out by infinities to to make formal notions of such theories. But especially in higher dimensions, that's kind of a weird thing to do. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Good. So, universal properties spectrum applied by crossing. So, what do I mean? So, for example, if you have a four point function, um, uh, you've probably seen a sort of cartoon for four point functions, which is something like this, where if you have four external operators, um, you might expand it in operators in the intermediate channel in what I would call the T channel, which is the two, the two top operators fusing onto another operator, which fuses onto the two bottom operators. Uh, we'll set this kind of notation up more tomorrow when we talk about four-point functions. But um, you might ask a question, you know, if I have some four-point function where there are some operator O propagating in one channel, um, then what does this imply about the expansion of the correlator in the other channel. And so you want to know what does the S channel uh, spectrum of exchanges look like given the existence of this operator here in the T channel. This is a little bit of a different question than the other two, because here we're assuming that certain operators exist. And we're asking, given the existence of, of one operator, what does that tell me about, about other operators? But, but of course, they're morally similar. So can, can I ask a question about that? Yeah, yeah. So is, is the use of doing that, that you might be trying to like find the CFT dual of some, like your favorite ADS, uh, and then you know that some operators have to be there and you can ask like whether you can get a consistent CFT with the right properties that, that you're looking for or or what? What is, that is one way that, that is one way to, to use this kind of, um, this, this kind of thought process. And actually answering this type of question in CFT is a way of reconstructing the CFT operator content in a crossing symmetric sum of exchange Witten diagrams in the bulk, um, which we will talk a bit more about. Um, and so that, so, so indeed you're, you're in your setup, you have say some operator dual to some bulk field. And if you know there's a cubic vertex, which would give rise to this exchange, then by answering this kind of question, you're, you're inferring information about other operators in the spectrum. And in that setting, it's actually double trace operators made of the two external guys. Um, but, but even more generally, um, one version of this is where you have, so, so in the non-polygraphic context, if you have some identical operator four-point function and in the intermediate channel, you have the identity, you can ask what does the existence of the identity, which you know, every reasonable field theory has, imply about the spectrum. And so that statement would apply to essentially every theory. Um, okay. And so that, that very question is the foundation of what's known as the light cone bootstrap. And the answer for, in that case, what these O primes are on the other side, um, gives a notion of composite operator that applies to any CFT. Um, that works at large spin and sort of set the stage for a notion of a regular trajectory in CFTs, which was later formalized by some papers by Karen Huo. Um, so to summarize, yes, you can use this type of technique for holographic CFTs, but also even in non-holographic ones, it can be quite powerful. Cool. 
Okay. And finally, you might be interested in asymptotics of spectral or OPE data in general CFTs or in certain universality classes of CFTs. So for example, if you have an operator, say O1, whose dimension is very large, and then you have some other operator O2, whose dimension is fixed, then you might ask, what is the OPE coefficient of say one, one, two, or perhaps some other combination involving ones and twos? How does this scale with this heavy dimension delta one? Understanding this in the limit where delta one becomes large um, is what I mean by the asymptotics of the spectral or PE data. And, and this question does have a nice holographic interpretation, which perhaps we'll talk about. So here I've highlighted four kind of um, questions that you see when you read bootstrap literature and which some of the original um, sort of bootstrap 2.0 papers from 2008 um, uh, tried to answer. <clears throat> And so surely you have seen, um, if you have read any bootstrap papers, and of course, if not, that's, that's fine. That's what uh, this lecture series is for. Um, some plots of the kinds of constraints that people studying the conformal bootstrap get on this CFT data. So this is very much a cartoon, but let us plot some OPE data. By that, I mean dimensions in uh, OPE coefficients against each other. So you might see some plot of two operator dimensions and some universality class of theory, say some theory with some global symmetry. Um, and there will be some regions which have some shapes. Okay. And in the plot like this, the regions outside these uh, green areas are meant to be rigorously ruled out by imposing some bootstrap condition, so usually crossing on four point functions uh, in combination with unitarity. So a region out here in this red X area is uh, a region of this delta I delta J space, which is disallowed. And on the other hand, in these green regions, um, as far as we know, they may be allowed or are allowed, but this type of technique does not rigorously rule in theories, it rules theories out. So you see plots like this, and as the techniques get stronger and stronger, the allowed regions tend to get smaller and smaller. Um, historically, theories that uh, we know about have sometimes been found to lie at uh, special points on these plots. So in that case, which happens, Sometimes theories that we know about, for example, the 3D icing model may live at a kink or inside a small island in the space of the allowed conformal weights or uh, OPE coefficients. Um, and in this kind of cartoon, there's this region over here, which whose bounds I haven't drawn. And often there are infinite or semi-infinite regions of these, um, of these spaces, which are unconstrained. Um, and that reflects in part that it's hard, at least numerically, to access the large delta um, region of the CFT data. Um, but uh, what should be emphasized in this kind of caricature is that the plots that are generated this way are rigorous. And so the value is really in the regions that are ruled out. And then moreover, in finding features of these plots where known CFTs may or may not live, um, but depending on your perspective, perhaps you're interested in trying to find new theories we had no idea about or trying to understand how special the theories we already knew about really are. Okay. So, okay. Can I ask something general? Yeah. Um, yeah. So does the bootstrap ever allow you to make any strong converse statements like these theories are ruled in, like regions where you say these exist? Um, uh, I would say strictly speaking, no. Um, and so certain, um, but I would say that when I say no, I'm referring to, um, for example, just the kind of vanilla attempts to solve crossing for some set of correlators. Uh, often this is numerically, you get these plots. Um, regions are not ruled in using that technique. 
But uh, there are certain arguments, analytic arguments about the structure of CFTs, which are just you know, rigorous and true. And so those arguments may not rule in whole theories, but they're telling us definitely true things about, about CFTs. So there's a kind of duality of the approach. And with some of the techniques, techniques you, you learn things for sure. And with other techniques, you, you get kind of circumstantial evidence for existence of CFTs. Um, but you know, what you're really doing is ruling things out. Um, with that said, there are some more recent advances where um, people are able to, let's say, draw kind of contour maps in these maybe regions where the parameters of the problem are varied and they can sort of estimate likelihoods of theories existing by asking how the edges of these regions move as they uh, change the parameters involved. And so that's kind of taking a step closer toward answering that question. In other words, it's giving a kind of statistical answer um, of whether a theory exists or not, but it's not a, a binary, right? So. It was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, is it possible to have a like a point with an open neighborhood that's completely empty? <laughs> um, you, so, sorry. So you're imagining a point where there is a theory, and then yeah. an open neighborhood around it where there is not a theory, where theories yeah. are distant. Uh, for all we know, yes. Um, Yes, I mean, I think in some this might this might not this might be a matter of personal philosophy, but that might even be argued to be the generic situation in certain regions of CFT space where the average CFT doesn't have any continuously tunable parameters with exactly marginal couplings, and so um, without supersymmetry, without any other sort of super structure. Um, one might expect that CFTs are dotting the landscape, but but they're isolated. Um, certainly in this sort of more narrow sense of are there exactly marginal directions or not, I think the sort of folklore is that without supersymmetry, CFTs do not could not have exactly marginal couplings absent any fine tuning that would keep the dimension of some operators to be exactly equal to, to D. Um, and so in that sense, yes, CFTs should be isolated. And I think that amounts to, to answering your question with a yes, but um, um, you know, the space of CFTs is rich and, and we don't, there are, there are cases of, of interest where there is supersymmetry and so on. So some cases would be like that, some cases would not, but I might say the generic case would be like that, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Okay. So, um, so I want to emphasize that, again, this point that from the bootstrap perspective, CFTs are lists of this operator data. And we don't get to see what operators are made of. That's not a good question from the bootstrap point of view. You have some list of dimensions delta, some OP coefficient CIJK, and you don't get to ask, you know, what is this operator? What's inside the operator? Um, and so a nice uh, type of example to keep in mind is really thinking about you know, conformal gauge theories where the observables are gauge invariant. And so the local operators, which themselves are gauge invariant, um, carry these quantum numbers. And uh, from that perspective, we don't get to know whether it's um, you know, what the constituents are that make this, this trace inside this trace. Uh, to make something gauge invariant. And so uh, let's, sorry, maybe it's a little differently. In conformal gauge theories, from the bootstrap perspective, there is no N. So, for example, if you have an SCN gauge theory uh, that is conformal, um, you really shouldn't think of there being an N. Instead, you should think of there being some central charge, um, which captures the number of degrees of freedom. So for example, every local CFT has a stress tensor. And the two-point function of the stress tensor is equal to a certain 
structure determined by conformal symmetry, let's say rho, rho sigma, uh, times a constant, which is usually denoted as CT. So CT is a central charge. In even dimensions, this is related to the central charge C appearing in the viral anomaly, but CT exists in odd dimensions as well. And so you can think of this as a kind of general notion of the amount of stuff in a theory, although you really shouldn't think of it as a degree of freedom, counting degrees of freedom in the sense of a C theorem. Indeed, CT does not obey a C theorem in greater than two dimensions. But uh, instead of thinking of N in a conformal gauge theory, you should really think of CT as telling you, uh, you know, indexing some, some sequence of theories, say. And a type of example that's especially pertinent for us in this sequence about um, uh, bootstrap radius CFT is the example of any crystal superang nulls. Oh, no, that's not good. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the shiftiness of the iPad. And here I mean d equals four, where this is conformal. Now, uh, you might think, OK, I know about n equals 4 super n mills, and I know it has an ADS5 times S5 dual. And that's what n equals 4 CFTs in four dimensions are. But it's not so simple from the point of view of the bootstrap. So when we say super yang mills, uh, you know, that implies that we're talking about gosh, excuse me, the Lagrangian gauge theory. Um, and so there is gauge group G. So for much of what I discuss, I'll be imagining that it's S U N. Um, and the central charge of the CFT is bin G over four, which for S U N, of course, is n squared minus one over four. Now, if someone asks you to construct the Lagrangian of n equals four S C F T in four dimensions, um, then that is unique. <clears throat> there might be some caveat here about possible couplings to some topological sectors, but let's not worry about that. Um, and that has not actually even been shown to be possible as far as I know. But the point is that if you insist on there being a Lagrangian, there's a unique one that has this, this symmetry. Now, from the bootstrap point of view, the Lagrangian is a member of the stress tensor multiplet. And of course, every local CFT should have a stress tensor and the n equals four supersymmetry tells us that the stress tensor sits in a super multiplet with a bunch of other operators and that includes the Lagrangian. So let's just uh, uh, list the operator content of the n equals four stress tensor super multiplet. So we have O2, now what is O2? This is the superconformal primary. It's a scalar of dimension two. And it lives in the 20 prime of the SU4 R symmetry, uh, which is the R symmetry implied by the existence of n equals four superconformal symmetry. So there also in this multiplet are the R currents in the adjoint of SU4. And there's the stress tensor, which is being not the superconformal primary, just like every other operator in here besides O2, which is a descendant of O2. This, of course, is dimension four and spin two. I should write this just for completeness. These have dimension three and spin one. And in addition, there's the Lagrangian, which is a certain super descendant of O2. And there's also the L bar operator, which is obtained by acting with the Q bar supercharges instead of the Qs. And this guy is an exactly marginal scalar. So so we learned that any n equals four super conformal theory in four dimensions with a stress tensor must have all of these operators. And that includes this operator L, which is an exactly marginal scalar, and so there is a, a flat direction. 
And again, if there's going to be a Lagrangian, then the theory is unique. But as trying to explain, we don't get to ask to know if there is a Lagrangian from the bootstrap point of view. So if we ask, is n equals four super Yang Mills the unique n equals four SCFT in four dimensions? The answer is we don't know. Phrased a little differently, we know that there must exist a stress tensor multiplet, but what else does n equals four superconformal theory in four dimensions have to have besides this multiplet? <clears throat> the Lagrangian theory has a lot of multiplets which can be enumerated, um, say at the free fix point, by writing down traces of the elementary fields in the Lagrangian. Some of those are BPS, some are non-BPS, um, but uh, besides this multiplet, neither is naively required by the existence of the n equals four superconformal symmetry. <clears throat> Not only that, but if we ask, okay, there's an exactly marginal direction, and we know that in the case of the Lagrangian theory, it's, it's the gauge coupling, um, well, the gauge coupling is not directly observable. Instead, from the bootstrap point of view, the dependence of the non-BPS operator data on this exactly marginal coupling is a proxy for measuring where on this manifold of CFTs you are. And so in the general case, you don't get to know the exactly marginal coupling is a gauge coupling. In fact, it might not be if these ex exotic n equals four CFTs exist. There would just be some other operator with an exactly marginal uh, coupling associated to it, and uh, you know that's where that's where it ends. There's nothing more to say. But we don't know if these theories exist, and that I should say is an open question. Um, but we do know some things. So what do we know? And this is where the bootstrap made a very nice contribution, um, among other places, of course. So. In a paper by Beam, Rastelli, and Van Rees from 2014, I believe, called N equals four superconformal bootstrap. Um, well, they showed various things, some of which we'll touch on throughout the course. Um, they showed that any interacting N equals four CFT has central charge C bounded below by three quarters. <laughs> Now recall, SU2, super Yang mills, has central charge, three quarters, and that's the minimal central charge of any Lagrangian uh, super Yang mills theory. But this result here was derived just by studying crossing symmetry of the four point function of the superconformal primary and the stress tensor multiplet. That is to say, they assumed the minimal thing needed for this theory to exist imposed the unitarity in n equals four superconformal symmetry and asked what the consequences were. And actually, in that case, analytically derived this lower bound in the central charge, uh, assuming that CFT is interacting. <clears throat> what happened there is really the, the interacting thing played an important role. They showed that unless C is in this range, then there are certain multiplets which contain higher spin currents. And any CFT containing higher spin currents, which are those with spin greater than two, uh, is necessarily free. We'll, we'll revisit that, uh, I think, momentarily and also later in the, in the lectures. So this is, an, this is an analytic result. And you see that it dovetails very nicely with something we knew about the Lagrangian theory, but it derived it in complete generality. So it's an abstract derivation of properties in this explicit Lagrangian n equals four theory we know. Maybe this leads you to think that, OK, this is some piece of evidence that the Lagrangian theory is the unique one, period. Um, maybe not. but this is just a true result, and then one can proceed and see what else one can extract. So that's a taste of the kind of thing that the bootstrap can do in this even very highly supersymmetric setting, um, where you know I should emphasize it is an open problem to, to answer this question here uh, in complete generality. Now, many of you are probably wondering, what about ADS5 times S5? Um, we'll talk about that later. Okay, let me pause here for a moment.
Are there any questions? Uh, sorry, this is this is very, oh, go for it. You can go ahead. Okay, this is just a very basic question, but did you uh, can you say again why there is no notion of n for the conformal gauge theories? Sure. So <clears throat> there is a notion of n for the conformal gauge theories because one has to pick a gauge group which has an n in it. But then, having written down the gauge theory of Lagrangian, you can enumerate the gauge invariant operators. And you can even imagine being powerful enough to you know, track their dimensions across the conformal manifold as you vary, as you vary this exactly marginal coupling. Um, and this family of CFTs is, is indexed by n. But from the perspective of the dimensions and OP coefficients of these gauge invariant operators, um, you know, n doesn't appear as n per se. It appears by way of, uh, say, the central charge or other data um, in that class. And so that's a sense in which, I mean, there's no n. There, there is a c. And in the, in the gauge theory, c depends on n, and other things depend on n. But if you're just trying to sort of bottom up derive what an n equals 4 SCFT must look like without knowing that it is allowed to be a gauge theory, then instead of using n, you should use c, which is something that can be associated to um, an operator without, you know, while being agnostic about whether it belongs to the gauge theory. OK, thank you. Sure. How do you impose that it's a gauge theory in the bootstrap? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a good question. And so you can, um, if you want to go outside the realm of local operators, then there, there can be ways to do this. But I think that's sort of dodging the question because that's not strictly within the realm of the traditional bootstrap. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure what a good answer to that question is. Other people might have answers, but I, I'm, I feel like I don't have a satisfactory answer to that. Um, sorry, when these people did because, this bootstrap because for the, n equals four. Sorry? Like, so when, when you mentioned a paper which did it for n equals four super young, but did the imposer a gauge theory? Or no, 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 uh, absolutely not. Just that, n equals that four. the key point. Okay, yeah. I see. So, so they, they it doesn't said, have to be gauge theory. And equals for a CFT. Right. Yeah. Yes, they, they imposed the existence of the stress tensor multiplet, the fact that the operators organize themselves into representations of the n equals four superconformal algebra. They imposed unitarity and crossing symmetry, and that's it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, you might also say, you know. At, so, so the, the gauge theory is realize a, a discrete set of central charges. Um, can you have an n equals four theory with central charge equal to three quarters plus pi? Um, if you just believe that the Lagrangian theories are the only ones, then the answer would, would be no, um, unless there's a dimension of the gauge group equal to four pi that I'm not aware of. But um, Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to transition to, to large n. Um, and so, good. So, bootstrap for ADCFT, what this really means is trying to bootstrap the space of large n theories and make contact with, with bulk physics. Um, so, what do we mean when we say large n? Um, it wants us to define this with a little bit of care. And I know, sorry, I realize in the, in the context of the previous discussion, saying large n is a little bit misleading because I just said there's no n. Nomenclature is such that we often use large n to mean large central charge. And by saying n, we're not committing ourselves to there being a gauge theory or anything else. So I'm sure that during this uh, set of lectures, I'm going to say large n when really you should just think of that as large c. Um, but um, I, I, yeah, I guess I set, set myself up for that clumsy uh, transition. But um, Okay, so when we say a large n or a large c, what do we mean? Um, so let's imagine there's a family of theories with increasing central charge. And these theories we'll call T sub i. So we're imagining that we have some sequence of CFTs. Such that there's some 
limiting theory or some limit one can take on the sequence where in the limit, the uh, limiting theory exists and has large central charge in the limit. So what does exists mean? Well, this means that the limiting theory obeys CFT axioms or consistency conditions, which is an axiom in quotes here, and that the observables are finite. For example, the partition function. <clears throat> so of course, C in this theory is getting very large. Uh, so when I say finite, what I really mean is something like this. If you ask, what is the number of operators um, with conformal weight below some finite delta star of order one, if I integrate the density of states from zero up to some finite delta, um, that this should be finite. From the large C limit, you have some sequence of theories and the density of state is such that it doesn't diverge below some finite dimension. If you look at densities of states of operators whose dimensions are of order C, well, C is becoming infinite. And so those densities of states are free to sort of diverge in some manner with C. And um, indeed they do, you know, in two dimensions, the Cardi formula has a C in it, um, but that's, that's just part and parcel with the existence of this large C limit. So this is just slightly more formally what we mean when we talk about a large CCFT as a sequence. Um, and we imagine taking the sequence such that the central charge becomes larger and larger, and we can eventually perform a perturbative expansion around, around large C. There may often be other scales in this sequence as well, besides the central charge. Um, and so that will be, will be important. Now, there are challenges for the large C bootstrap, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail in the third lecture. Um, because as you take a large central charge limit, it can be harder and harder to impose the consistency conditions. Um, and one might get tripped up in trying to distinguish between families, which has to, to large C, and theories which are sort of sporadic in the landscape, but have very large but finite C. We're not very good at answering that latter question. Um, um, but uh, even in this sort of safer setting where we have a sequence of theories, you know, there's a lot to do and understand. Um, but, so now let's recall the idea safety dictionary, which Mukund discussed nicely in his lectures. So if we have some bulk field phi i, some elementary fields in ADS, and here I'm going to be somewhat quick. Uh, this, and, and I'm imagining this bulk field phi i to be light, so it has, say, an order one mass, or at least a mass that doesn't scale with, with Newton's constant. Uh, then we think of this as being dual to a single trace operator, O sub i. We can have composites, say phi i to the n, of the bulk fields, which are bound states in ADS. And those are dual to multi-trace operators which are roughly speaking, just composites of the single trace operator on the CFT side, which are themselves conformal primaries. In ADS, you have a mass associated to these fields. And on the CFT side, you have a conformal weight. And the relation between the two is enforced by the equations of motion, which say for scalars is this. And for other fields of spin, it's something else. And finally, in the bulk, we would have cubic vertices. And the CFT, we have OPE coefficients. And the dictionary is such that the OPE coefficients are equal to the vertices times some kinematic vector. And the kinematic factor just comes from doing this three-point written integral. The explicit form of the factor is not important at all for what I'm trying to say, um, because all I'm trying to say is that when we talk about a space of CFTs, well, likewise, there's a space of theories of quantum gravity and ADS, and we can imagine making plots that look just like the ones before, um, where we say plot some masses or uh, vertices uh, against each other. And there are some regions which may be allowed and regions which may be not allowed. Okay. And so the um, bootstrap for ADS-CFT is trying to understand the map between these spaces. 
which types of theories on one side look like which types of theories on the other. And in situations where we can meaningfully constrain one side, we can import that to the other and learn something. So, you know, there are a lot of prickly questions in quantum gravity. Um, ADS-CFT tells us that at least formally, they can be rephrased um, in terms of a local conformal field theoretic description, which may be easier to work with or more trustworthy. And so that I think is a lot of the power of the bootstrap in the holographic context. Answering questions about conformal field theories in a totally controlled setting tells us things about quantum gravity in ADS at least, um, which are hard to access or even formulate otherwise. Okay. So we can talk a little bit about different types of, of bulk theories. Um, and so I won't talk too much about this, but um, I mean, right now, although it'll be at the core of what we talk about so throughout the sort of lectures. So if we look at classical theories, yes, there are different types. Right? So, so here, this 2D plot of, you know, where n is on one axis and, and lambda is on the other. Here I'm imagining we take large n and we can just ask ourselves what kinds of classical theories of quantum gravity and yes are there. Um, and so maybe let's draw this a little different way. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cap it off um, just for clarity. So on one end, so, so we can think of this as interpolating in in the coupling, which I'll call lambda for now. Okay. So over here at strong coupling, so lambda is very large. We have theories that look like Einstein gravity or supergravity coupled to matter. Right? So these are in a sense the nicest types of bulk theories. There is a derivative expansion and a two derivative order, it's Einstein gravity suitably dressed. And lambda um, in the bulk is something like the string length, um, uh, which is much uh, larger than the Planck length, but much smaller than the ADS radius. Okay. So let's in the D3 setting, it's this. So let's just keep this in mind as a kind of mnemonic. Um, uh, on the other hand, you can have theories which are much sort of uglier and more complicated um, than Einstein gravity or supergravity. And these would be theories that are like um, some sort of higher spin gravity. Or the Siliev type theory. Now, um, when lambda is small or order one, actually this, this relation does not literally hold. So when you think about the D3 example as trying to, to orient you, you should think of lambda going to zero as corresponding to LADS approaching the string length. So the ADS and string scales are, are comparable and there's no separation of scales there. Okay. So often when we talk about holography in controlled settings, we're talking about what goes on over here. Okay. And over here, um, well, string theory is um, still classical, but alpha prime is, is very much finite. And, um, you know, we have much less control. And these Vassiliev theories are certain theories of higher spin gravity, which means they have higher spin gauge fields in the bulk, um, which are not known to be subsectors of string theory, but are believed to capture some part of the ON models on the boundary in the holographic dual sense. Um, I won't much say much more about this, um, although I'm happy to answer questions and I've worked on it myself. But um, part of what we want to understand is what lambda really means from the abstract CFT point of view. <clears throat> After all, we're not really allowed, or we really shouldn't assume that there is string theory in the bulk. If we're trying to understand the space of theories of radius quantum gravity, then we don't want to input that the bulk theory is a string theory. And so if lambda was supposed to be some power of the ratio of the ADS radius to the string scale, but there's no string scale, well, then what is lambda? What is the abstract proxy for strong coupling? So what is 
strong coupling abstractly. <clears throat> and so the way I drew this, and of course I said nothing about what happens in the middle because you know it's, it's exceedingly complicated. Um, there you have uh, when lambda is order one, you know the theory is sufficiently stringy that you have to deal with that, but there's not some emergent higher spin symmetry, so it's really just best to think about the two endpoints. Um, we will see that um, strong coupling is, um, as suggested by this diagram, equivalent to having a large higher spin gap. So what does this mean? That the dimension delta gap, where this is defined as dimension of the lightest single trace operator of spin greater than two, is much greater than one. Now in string theory context, say n equals four, <clears throat> um, uh, lambda, the ratio of the ADS scale to the string scale, sort of controls everything as lambda gets large. Things like the Konishi, which is a scalar, acquire anomalous dimensions that go like lambda to the one quarter. Uh, but it also controls the dimensions of higher spin single trace operators, which, which grow with lambda likewise. And so one of the key things that has been sort of affirmed time and time again over the last uh, several years, starting with a paper by Hainskirk, Penedonis, Polchinski, and Sully, which will be the centerpiece of our, our third lecture, is that having a large gap in the single trace higher spin spectrum is the abstract version of what it means to have a strongly coupled theory. And so this gets us at least a large part of the way toward addressing what necessary and sufficient conditions are for a CFT to have a nice holographic dual. If by nice, you mean Einstein-like coupled to matter of low spin. So here I'm previewing a bit what that punchline is um, by sort of zooming out on, on the space of theories. Uh, I have a question. Please. So if I just talk in terms of the Hamiltonian, if I diagonalize the Hamiltonian corresponding to this theory, that's like saying that um, there's a there's a big gap between the ground state and the first excited state. Um, so if you look at the, so it's a little more subtle than that because you need to just be talking about the higher spin states, first of all. And second of all, you need to be talking about the single trace higher spin states. <clears throat> so in other words, elementary fields, as it were, in the bulk. If you have a scalar field, um, which is light, um, that's OK. Right? That doesn't spoil this condition. And moreover, composites of the scalar field will have spin. So if you have two blobs in ADS, they will mutually orbit around the center of ADS and the Hobson angular momentum. And that would be a conformal primary in the dual CFT. So when we formulate this condition, we're talking about the single trace higher spin spectrum. And if this leaves you wondering, well, where does that come from? Well, one of the features of string theory is that strings come with infinite towers of higher spin excitations. And so, sort of abstracting from the pictures that we know and love involving D-brains, um, the piece that seems to be relevant for understanding at an abstract level what, what acts as the coupling is the gap to this type of operator, which comes for free in string theory, but more generally um, uh, you know, defies some other characterization in the bootstrap philosophy that I've been trying to, to explain. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. We really will talk, talk quite a bit more about this, um, especially on, on day three. So, good. Um, can yes. I ask? Yeah. Um, how are you characterizing abstractly what you mean by single trace operator versus multi-trace operator? So here I'm imagining we have a sequence of, of CFTs that goes out to large C. And um, I am... Um, so let's see, what's the sharpest way to say this? You're, you're asking just from the CFT side, it sounds like. You don't want me to, to use both notions when I answer that, do you? 
Is that right? Sorry, my, my interconnection, internet connection is oh, a little bit bad. Sorry, I'm asking, you're asking me to answer that just from the CFT side, is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If, if your theory has a description as a gauge theory, then you know what single trace, multi-trace yes. means, but otherwise yes. I'm not. Yeah, I've so, been so confused about this point. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say it relies on notions of large C factorization and, and correlators, but you, you can imagine starting from the ground state, you know, moving up in the spectrum until you hit the, the next state, Say it's some scalar with some dimension, um, and you know, looking at some four point function of that operator and asking ones in the intermediate channel, and um, and you know, at infinite c, the decomposition of that four point function will look like uh, it'll it'll be that of generalized free fields where the spectrum is comprised of that operator and um, all its double trace composites. And so knowing those, you know, knowing the operator dimension, you can sort of delete those higher guys from the spectrum and then ask, okay, what is the next operator in the spectrum? Um, and then sort of do the same thing. So once you identify iteratively from the vacuum, some set of operators, then you can just construct the engineering dimensions of their composites and look for them in the spectrum and, and delete them. That's a kind of um, algorithmic way you can imagine doing this. But the shorter answer is just that when we, um, assume a large n or large c factorization of our of our correlation functions, then that makes this distinction sort of easier to to ferret out when you decompose correlators. But it, it essentially amounts to what I what I said. Great, that makes sense. Thanks. Sure. Okay, um, I have about six minutes, so um, let me. Return to this. Can, can you talk a little bit about um, about scales? Now, having introduced this notion of the, the higher spin gap, um, you know what kinds of operators do nice holographic theories have? So, and I imagine I'll want to sort of return to this plot and. The next lecture in view of time, but let me just sort of put it up here. So if we have some scale delta gap, which I remind you is the gap to the first um, higher spin single trace operator, <clears throat> and we're gonna have a central charge in the theory, which is also becoming large, <clears throat> then the operators can be organized according to, to scale. Right? In terms of the length scales of the theory, we have LADS, L plank, and something like L string, perhaps, not necessarily, but perhaps. Um, and so if we take dimensionless ratios, then this gives us, uh, well, let me just not call this n, let me call this c, I did it again, let's see, uh, which is some um, power of LADS over L Planck. <clears throat> and then something like lambda, which really we, we know we should call delta gap in the abstract sense. Um, and so we have these two scales. We have a large C theory where delta gap is some other scale in the problem, which is much less than C. Um, and so we have operators that fall somewhere on this scale. So in this range, where operators have dimensions which are order one, or at least say parametrically less than the delta gap, we have light operators. So these sort of form an effective field theory in ADS, where we have some light fields coupled to gravity. Uh, so this light sector, of course, includes the graviton. Up here, where operator dimensions are order C. Um, let's call this the second one. These are usually known as heavy operators where dimensions are order C or greater. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you also have this region here where operator dimensions are of order of the gap. And this is sort of 1A. Let's call this the stringy or higher spin region of the spectrum. Okay. So in the light part of the spectrum, that's what is relevant when one is computing, say, correlators of, of local operators with, with order one dimensions. Okay, so when you see people computing Witten diagrams involving propagators and so on, as we will, these fields on these legs uh, typically are light fields in the EFT and ADS. Um, and so this can include, so this you know, includes the graviton, it can include KK modes, Etc. 
uh, up here in the heavy region, well, these operators have dimensions of order C. And so, uh, say, placing a particle in ADS and turning its mass all the way up to be of order uh, the inverse Newton's constant, then there's going to be back reaction. And you have things like black holes or perhaps conical defects, say, in ADS3. Um, and there is another range in here where you can have operators whose dimensions are, say, of order root C, some power of C less than one. These are like very heavy, sometimes called hefty. Um, these correspond to, say, D brain type states or determinants. Um, the bootstrap actually isn't said much about that, and I won't say much about that, but just for completeness, that's a kind of separate category of, of states here. Um, so they don't quite back react, but you know, they follow geodesics, the way functions are sharply localized. And then you have this um, sort of stringy region where you would have states like short strings in ADS, where the dimension in a string theory would be some, um, some positive power of, of delta gap. Um, a lot of what we do in large end bootstrap comes down to understanding what this light EFT region is allowed to look like and how it sort of plays with these other regions and how consistency conditions relate them. <clears throat> so there are many ways in which that's true, and we'll talk about some of them. Um, and to conclude on a note that's related to what we said earlier, um, but I will definitely pick this up to start the next lecture. In this range over here is where you have KK modes whose dimensions are much greater than one, let's say much less than delta gap. <laughs> and so this region actually is very interesting in terms of the space of large CFTs because it contains information about the geometry and the number of dimensions. So recall the n equals four discussion from earlier. We were asking whether n equals four super Yang Mills was the unique n equals four super conformal field theory. And uh, well, as you know, this theory is dual to ADS5 times S5, uh, in particular type 2B string theory on that background. So if there's some other exotic n equals four theory out there, the bulk dual would be different. <clears throat> and uh, the S5, well, you might say, well, that has to be there because this geometrizes the R symmetry. There's an SU4 R symmetry, and that's the isometry group of S5. And we're taught that in ADS CFT, the gauge symmetries of the bulk are the global symmetries of the boundary. And the boundary has this global SU4 R symmetry. And that's why there must be these uh, non abelian gravophotons on the S5. But the S5 comes with a lot more than just that. It comes with an infinite tower of light KK modes because the radius of the S5 is of order the radius of the ADS5. So actually, it's quite a bit overkill if all you're trying to do is geometrize the R symmetry. Or rather, it's quite a bit of overkill if all you're trying to do is realize the R symmetry in the bulk. You can imagine that there was just a bulk gauge field for the SU4 uh, symmetry, and that's it. <clears throat> but instead, this theory comes with a ton of other stuff, all these light KK modes, which lie in this light EFT region I talked about up here. And so the question of uniqueness of n equals four super Yang mills is just one example um, under a larger umbrella of the question, is our symmetry always geometrized at the ADS scale? By which I mean, are there always large, that is ADS sized extra dimensions uh, um, which contain the currents of, of the asymmetry on the boundary. And so I think it's a fascinating open question. I, I've tried to think about it a bit myself, but um, uh, I'll go into a little more detail about this particular question to begin the next lecture. Um, for now, in view of the negative minutes I have, let me just say that, um, well, ADS3 CFT2 is special. So we're gonna talk about it a little bit separately in the fourth lecture. Um, but um, just to give an outline, well, it's a little silly to give an outline of what we already did. Let's say we talked about the big picture. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about 
holographic correlators and four point functions. And a bit about uh, the space of large end CFTs and what these correlators tell us. So we'll compute some wooden diagrams and ask about what aspects of that can be derived from the CFT alone. Um, and that will help us transition into talking about the space or taxonomy of large C holographic CFTs. This is where we'll talk about this uh, Haynes Kirk et al. paper, which um, sort of started the modern version of the subject. Um, and we'll talk about some other bootstrap type constraints that are used in the holographic setting. And then the last lecture, we'll talk about ADS3, CFT2, plus uh, open questions uh, that hopefully tie them together. So uh, let me conclude for today. Thanks, Eric. I should also um, say, um, sorry, I can stay for a while um, if there are questions, but I, I haven't been to gather yet, but is that still happening at 9.30 or sorry. 30? Uh, nine, yeah, whatever 30. So, uh, so the, what we're doing now is just, you know, we'll take a few quick questions that will be recorded. And then typically there are more questions if you have time to hang out and we'll just hang out in Zoom. We won't go to gather. Okay. There is okay. a gather meeting at, uh, for lunch at, uh, at one thirty local time, but yeah. Got it. Um, uh, yeah. So, so are there any, uh, quick questions for Eric? I have one. Uh, so the diagram that you drew, like the, for the delta, this is only for primary operators, right? Uh, um, well, uh, I'm uh, at this level. I didn't need to make the distinction, but maybe you can tell me what you're trying to get at. But what I'm saying is that if you have a light scalar, you know, you can take like you know hundred derivative of that, and and yeah. then uh, that that would fall uh, like between delta gap and C. But why would I call that operator stringy? Like that's just a light scalar. Yeah, no, that's true. In that sense, you you would not. But um, it is. But on the other hand, if you add enough momentum, you you will form a black hole. But that's kind of not all black holes are primaries. So but basically, I agree with you. But you do have to be a little careful about what the bulk dual is in that situation. Um, yeah, I, I really do have in mind indeed just the the it's clearest if you think about them as being primaries yes i guess you throw question it. it looked like yeah sorry oh did, did that was thinking yeah. deeply it's, uh, i didn't say anything so deep so imagine not <laughs> hey Manchu, are you happy with the answer <laughs> Maybe yeah. you can, maybe you can put it in the chat yeah. if you're unhappy. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, let's move on. Are there other quick questions? I I had one. So, do you have some simple intuition for these abstract reformulation of the statement and strong coupling? Like why this high this gap in higher spin states? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, I think there, there are a few ways to answer that, and, and we'll definitely talk, talk more about that. Um, the, so in, in various settings, you can show that if you have a, say, a light higher spin field, say some field of spin four or something interacting with gravity and with other particles, then it introduces causality violations or other problems such that it can only be fixed by adding an infinite tower of higher spins that all together uh, conspire to fix the problem and render the theory causal again. But then if you have an infinite tower of light higher spin fields, these dimensions are they're not all, I mean, the unitarity bound scales with spin, so they won't all be light in the delta sense, but they'll have low twist, which is defined as delta minus j. Then, then your theory starts to look very much not like, um, you know, Einstein plus some small perturbation. So that is what I just said is a kind of 
<clears throat> abstract version of what you see in string theory, where all the higher spin operators come packaged together as vibration nodes of a single underlying string. Um, but that abstract statement has been shown <clears throat> in various settings um, <clears throat> without relying on string theory. So that's one, that's one statement. If you have one, then you need them all. And then the theory looks sort of violently different from, from low energy gravity coupled to matter. Um, but um, and, and another statement along those lines is that if you have um, often, um, if you try to construct, imagine that you have higher spin currents. So if you have a, a higher spin operator, which actually saturates the unitarity bound, so it's exactly conserved and it's a current, then at least in CFT dimensions greater than two, um, in that situation, you also need an infinite tower of higher spin currents. So that's yet another setting where you see this whole set having to come together. Um, but um, more generally, just forgetting about these, these types of arguments that seem to abstract away from what happens in string theory, we know that um, we can couple gravity to, say, scalar fields um, or you know, operators with spin two or less um, by way of just constructing consistent classical gravity theories that have that operator content. Um, and, and scalars don't do anything bad there. And they also don't contribute strongly in various uh, regimes to four point functions where higher spin operators do contribute strongly. Here I have in mind like the Regge regime, although if you're not familiar, then that's okay. Um, so you know, even just by looking at, at examples, you see that, okay, this is a pattern. Um, it's always the derivative expansion seems to be controlled by the scale of new physics, which, which is associated with higher spin particles. Um, I hope that, that helps, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. All right, all right. let's uh, thank Eric. Um, and yeah, so in the recording.